encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. We're contemplating the practical message of Jesus for our lives. Welcome to Today with Jesus. I'm Robert Hadfield. I'm Dan Winkler, and Today with Jesus hopefully has been a part of your weekly routine as it is launched every Tuesday morning. Thank you so much for letting us come into your automobile, your home, but even more than that, hopefully with the message of Jesus into your heart. Mm -hmm. Robert, I'm kind of sad. I know. Today is the last episode of this season. I cannot believe we've march through the book of Colossians and what a benefit it has been to my life. I love this particular book. Well, it's been quick and it's just been five months, but uh, somehow we were just able to squeak in the four chapters. I know, I know. <laughs> but it has been really good. Just, just for a reminder for those who are listening, maybe this is your first season listening to us. We take a break uh, in the summer, in the middle of the year, and then at the end of the year, of course, during the holiday time and all of that. And so each segment of episodes between the breaks is a season in and of itself. So this is season five. We'll come back, Lord willing, in August for season six. So we're looking forward to it. So we're going to be in Colossians four today, I think, starting mm -hmm. with verse two and going through the end of the chapter and thus the end of the book, verse 18. It's uh, a very lengthy reading, but in reality, it, it just kind of compressed into Paul uh, extending his final greetings. He loved to do that in his writings. Mm -hmm. He would get really down deep and heavy in some philosophical or theological observation that he was making all through the book. And then he would come to the end, and it's like he said, now let's talk about each other. And he was uh, very um, in involved in people's lives, and he enjoyed t writing about people and to people. Uh, I guess that's why we love Paul so much, because he was so loving of people. Mm -hmm. So we're going to read verses 2 through 6. Robert, I think you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to read verses 7 through 17. And then we're going to leave the last verse to the for the close of our episode today. And once I have finished verses 7 to 17, I'm going to throw it back to you and let you kind of kick things off for us today. Let's see, what's, the, uh, what's this episode entitled? Yeah, Blessed by the Tie That Binds. It reminds me of a song that we sing often, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, Our Heart in Christian Love. And, uh, and we could have entitled it that using those lyrics, but I think more so as we read these closing verses of Colossians, uh, Blessed By the Tie is probably more appropriate. As we read these verses, we see our lives are truly blessed because of the relationship we enjoy with one another based upon the relationship we enjoy with Jesus Christ. Mm. So why don't you read verses 2 through 6, Robert, and then I'll pick it up there with verse 7. Sure. <laughs> Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I love that reading, and especially when he talks about we ought to speak this way there in verse 4, and then he says, when you speak, make sure it's always with grace. Boy, there's some thoughts right there in just those two yeah. observations that we could spend the entire episode with for certain. Mm -hmm. Verse 7 continues, and now we're reading about a list of names, various individuals that had made their way into the life of Paul. So, and I'm reading these names, Robert, and uh, I, I read of all these names and I'm thinking, who I'm glad I don't have to write that on the bottom of a check. <laughs> and then I, I read all these names and they all end with us, 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 us. And then you come up with a mark 
and a yeah, Luke. That's right. And an Empha. And I'm thinking, and I could go with that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's read these names and these, uh, these verses. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who's called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he's worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. And that's through verse 17. So now we step back and we see that we have read verses that just pulsate with relationship. And uh, there's some marvelous things that we can take home with us as our study of Colossians uh, comes to a close, Robert. Why don't you start things off in talking about this glorious bond that we enjoy as fellow Christians mm -hmm. in uh, uh, the verses that we've read here? This is one of those sections that is easy to skip <laughs> when you get to the end of, <laughs> of Paul's epistles, you know, because people get there and they're like, oh, all these names, and I don't know how to pronounce half of them. And, you know, frankly, too, these names, I mean, several of these um, are only mentioned maybe here or in Philemon. Archippus is one of those, Onesimus another. Um, of course, we've read of Epaphras already here in this epistle to the Colossians. You know, the famous ones are Mark and Luke. And of course, uh, you know, we sort of, if you want to say B level, we talk about A level celebrities and B level celebrities. <laughs> One, ones that are a little less known, uh, but, but we know sort of a little bit about them are people like maybe Demas. You know, we think about 2 Timothy and we know he'll be unfaithful by the end of Paul's ministry, yeah. unfortunately. But what I like about this section, and, and first of all, you already noted there's things here that are worthy of our study. But I love that Paul is a man of relationship. And contrary sometimes to the way that some preachers approach ministry today, Paul was not afraid to declare the whole counsel of God, even if that meant at times reproof and saying hard things. But he never intended to write people off, to just excommunicate them or to uh, say something and and then leave all of the bloodshed or hurt feelings behind. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that uh, in sections like this one. Um, of course, here, it, it's all positive things that he's saying for the most part, a few exhortations here and there. But it just highlights the bond. And so here's Paul, and he's doctrinally sound, but he's also very much in tune with the bond of fellowship. Right. And that's what makes this so special, I think. And makes him so special. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So as I'm looking into this, I, I was looking at this section a little bit, and I started honing in on the imperative verbs, which, you know, Paul uh, uses quite a few of imperative verbs as he's writing here and there. He's got a lot to say, and there are commands or things that he wants you to, to do and things to know. As I'm looking through these imperative verbs, I've noticed several, and from them, five observations that just help to highlight this bond that we okay. have. 
In the first place, verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. Continue is an imperative verb. We'll see another one down in verse 18. I know you didn't read that a minute ago, but if I can just highlight when he says, remember my chains, there's Mm -hmm. another imperative verb. And the sense there seems to be, remember those as you pray. Paul will mention his prayer, uh, his chains again uh, between here and there as well. He says, I'm in prison on account of the mystery of Christ there in verse 3. Paul wants these people to be prayerful that as as people who are in fellowship with Jesus and therefore in fellowship with one another, we pray together and we pray for each other. Be watchful in your prayer with thanksgiving, verse 2. And then pray for this door to be opened, verse 3, a door for the word. Uh, And so Paul says, I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray with thanksgiving. I want you to pray for the work that we share together. Just pray. Paul doesn't discount the power of prayer. In the second place, I go down to verses 5 and 6, and I see walk in wisdom as an imperative verb. There are several participles that are going to sort of modify that. Here's how you do it making the best use of the time, and then ensuring that our speech is seasoned with salt. This is how I walk in wisdom. But specifically, he says, I'm walking in wisdom toward outsiders, verse 5, those Mm. who are outside of Christ, those who are not Christians. Paul spent so much time emphasizing, particularly at the end of chapter 2 and at the beginning of chapter 3, you do have a relationship with Jesus. You know you have that relationship. Here's how you live as those who are changed and connect, changed by and connected to Jesus. So he says, okay, now walk in wisdom toward those who are outside of Christ. That's how you make the best use of your time. That's why you're going to season your speech with salt, making sure it's always gracious, because people are going to ask you questions, and you want to know how to answer each Mm -hmm. person. So we walk in wisdom. And that reminds me that we share a common mission. We pray together and for each other, number one. And number two, we share a common mission. Every Christian is interested in spreading the good news of Jesus to others. And we all have to be constantly aware with whom I am speaking. Am I speaking to someone who's a brother or sister in Jesus? Or am I speaking to someone who isn't? And if I'm not speaking to someone who's a brother or sister in Jesus, then how can I make the best use of this opportunity, of this moment? But really, the time as it's paralleled in Ephesians 5, refers to a season. Here's a moment, here's an opportunity that is fleeting, it's passing. You know, Paul will say redeeming the time in Ephesians 5 because the days are evil. And so here he he exhorts these Christians to keep their common mission in front of them at all times and thus to be gracious with speech and to be diligent in how they use their time. In the next place, I drop down and I see in verse 10, some exhortations regarding Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And then this parenthetical uh, imperative, concerning whom you have received instructions that if he comes to you, welcome him. And welcome is an imperative. You're supposed to do that. Now, Paul and Mark and Barnabas, for that matter, have a history. (laughs) I read that back in the book of Acts. When Paul and Barnabas, who had been traveling companions for so long, parted ways because Barnabas was determined that Mark should continue traveling with them. Mark had been with them on a previous period of travel, but Mark left early for some reason. The text doesn't give us specifics as to why, but Mark sort of, it seems from Paul's perspective, kind of abandoned them in that moment. Mm -hmm. Barnabas said, oh, I think we ought to take him. Paul said, no, I don't think we should. They didn't break fellowship. Instead, They just went in different directions in terms of travel. The work continued and perhaps even was spread even more because of that encounter. Later, in fact, well, here in Colossians 4, we have an indicator that Paul has had a change of heart regarding Mark, or maybe rather that Mark has proved himself to Paul. In 2 Timothy, later in chapter 4, he'll say, he's useful to me, so bring him. He's useful for the ministry. It is intriguing that Paul needs to tell the Christians in Colossae, if he comes to you, 
you're supposed to welcome him. You've, re- you've received the instructions on him. You welcome him. And that helps us to give a little further insight into Paul's heart, even going back to the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. Did, did Paul not like Mark? You know, or did, were they those kind of people that sat on opposite ends of the auditorium and didn't talk to each other at fellowship meals or whatever? And uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think that's the case at all. What I'm reminded by this imperative where Paul tells these Christians, you welcome Mark, you, you've, you welcome him as a brother. And that reminds me that we're committed to fellowship. And fellowship, yes, the good times, hi, how are you? We hug each other, you know, we laugh together, we cry together, but also those moments maybe where we've experienced a past and maybe mistakes have been made. And we're willing to help each other work through those things and to emphasize that bond that we have together in Jesus. I'm certainly not going to do something to damage that bond or to sever that bond. I want to magnify that and enhance it as much as possible. I drop down to verse 15 and I see another imperative. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. Give the imperative verb there. Give my greetings to these brothers. You know, um, maybe we take it for granted today, but uh, to say, hey, if you see so-and-so, tell them hello, tell them I said hi. And to offer a greeting to another person, you know, now we can send an email or, or shoot a direct message through Instagram or Facebook or a text message or something like that. It's really easy. We don't even have to deal with long distance charges anymore. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what a world, Thank goodness. <laughs> but yeah, but in that day and time, I mean, you think about the difficulty of communication, particularly with those who are in another town or, or great distances away. And it's important to Paul, Hey, the church in Laodicea. I want you to greet them. And I think as we discuss a little further, there's going to be even more brought out about the relationship between the two cities of Colossae and Laodicea as well. That just reminds me that we love each other and we, we want to send greetings. We want people to know, especially our brothers and sisters, hey, I'm thinking about you. I haven't forgotten about you. You know, out of sight, out of mind. That's true sometimes. But as Christians, we want to be intentional about being there for each other and loving each other and sending greetings toward each other. And I love that Paul models that here. Finally, I go down to verse 17 and I see relative to Archippus, he tells him, now, how would you like to be sitting in the Colossian assembly on the Lord's day? And they say, we have the latest letter from Paul. <laughs> and it's all good if you're Archippus until the very end. I mean, it's the next to last verse as we've got it today, right? The second to last or maybe the fourth to last sentence. <laughs> Say to Archippus. <laughs> we, see we, would you, it get your ear if you... <laughs> sorry, Archippus, what? <laughs> see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Archippus is one of these fellows who's only mentioned here in Colossians and then in Philemon, verse 2, his name means fellow soldier. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's difficult to know what specifically was his ministry. Is he teaching yeah. and preaching? Is he you know, helping widows? I mean, just to borrow from a few scenarios elsewhere in the New Testament. But uh, there is some need, Paul believes, for this exhortation. You don't give up. You keep doing it. You fulfill that which you have been tasked to do and which you received in the Lord. And I'm just reminded from this that we encourage each other. Sometimes that encouragement looks maybe a little more like exhortation, which may have a little bit more of a, of a reproof kind of ring to it or tone in the, in the definition. But, you know, sometimes we need that. Sometimes yeah. we need a little bit of motivation to get us going. Well, and Paul could, is willing to do that. You know, it could be that Archippus was the son of Philemon yeah. and Aphia, because mm-hmm. they're they're all mentioned right there together in That's Philemon true. verse one and two, mm-hmm. and uh, and it, that being the case, he might have been a a younger uh, brother in Christ, and like Timothy, you know, Paul had to say to Timothy, "Let no man despise your youth," and yeah. and he had to write to Timothy and encourage him 
to re-engage in the ministry. And it, mm-hmm. it, it may be that that's what he's doing with um, Archippus here as well. Yeah. Uh, so, so go over those imperatives yeah. for me one more time there. And I think uh, this, if I got them all. These five imperatives or these five observations from there are maybe seven imperatives. I've, I've grouped a few together. Uh, help to highlight this bond that we have. Number okay. one, we pray together and for each other. Continue okay. steadfastly in prayer. All Number right. two, we share a common mission, walk in wisdom toward mm. outsiders. Number three, we're committed to fellowship. If Mark comes to you, you welcome him. Okay. Number four, we love each other. Verse 15, give my greetings to the folks over at Laodicea. Great. And number five, we encourage each other to Archippus there in verse 17. Was there a C, C that you fulfill, that he fulfills That's his correct. ministry? Is yes, the, sir. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to make note of those things in my Bible. So I've been writing <laughs> in my Bible as you've been talking. That's great. So we have these imperatives and what they're emphasizing to really put an exclamation mark behind this bond, uh, this tie that binds our hearts together in Christ. And you know what else? One other thing that just struck me, too, is that sometimes, I mean, this bond isn't something that just happens. We're in fellowship with each other because we're in fellowship with God in Christ, but we have to cultivate this. And, And I think each of these demonstrates that, you know, that Paul is given these imperative commands. You do this, you do this, relative to the tie that binds us together. We're obligated to each other. You know, Robert, while we were reading this and and stepping back and just trying to see it as a whole, it it struck me that the Apostle Paul would mention someone's name, and then he'd say a little, give a little tidbit about that person. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, you know, here here's here's Tychicus, and then he says three things about him. Uh, He's a beloved brother. Uh, He's a faithful minister and he's a fellow servant. Yeah. And then there's uh, Onesimus, and he says almost the same thing. He, he's a faithful, and he's a beloved brother. Oh, and he belongs to the congregation there in Colossae. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you come down to Epaphras, and he talks about how the Epaph- he talk about he talks about the prayer life of Epaphras, yeah. and uh, and then Nympha, and how the church is meeting in her house. So all these little tidbits that he references about individuals, uh, Luke, the beloved physician. But I also noticed this. He referenced Demas by name, but he didn't say one thing in particular about Demas. Mm. I find that intriguing, don't yeah, you? That's true. You know, Demas is mentioned three times by the Apostle Paul, and uh, twice he's referenced as a, a fellow servant. Uh, but the last time he's mentioned, uh, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And it could be that uh, either the Holy Spirit, well, it could be that uh, Paul uh, sees some things developing in Demas's life, we don't know. But it's intriguing to me that the Holy Spirit did not single out little tidbits about that given apostle, or rather um, uh, yes, I... servant of, mm-hmm. of Jesus and co-worker of Paul. Mm. As I read through uh, verses 7 to 17, there are three things that come to my mind, Robert. Uh, here's the first one. Paul promoted friendship. Now, Paul never used the word friend in all of his writings, and he never used the word friendship in all of his writings, but he emphasized it over and again, and he loved to bring an epistle to a close, referencing various individuals by name. I read this, and the book of Romans came to my mind. How about yours? You know, he's so deeply theological in Romans chapters 1 through 11. And he's ever so practical in Romans chapters 12 to 15. And then he comes to that last chapter, Romans 16, and it's all about people. He just, he can't seem to even pick up his quill as he's writing unless he thinks about somebody else he wants to reference. Mm -hmm. And so he's constantly talking about all of these wonderful people in Romans 16. And uh, that that comes to my mind as I'm reading here in Colossians. Paul promoted friendship. Um, Thinking about the word friend as it occurs in the New Testament, 
And the book of James comes to my mind. And you'll remember that Abraham is called the friend of God. Mm. And uh, James 2.23. And, and we are reminded now, if you're going to be a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God in James 4, verse 4. And then I re remember what John, the beloved apostle and best friend of Jesus, wrote in 3 John 15. Greet the friends. The friends greet you. And so uh, the Bible really emphasizes friendship. And we don't have the time in this episode, but I'd like to just kind of throw out a homework assignment for everybody that likes to do a deep dive here and there. Go to the book of Proverbs and look up the word friend, friends, friendship in the book of Proverbs and let your life be enriched by what the Holy Spirit says about joining your heart to the hearts of others in friendship and see what friends do for us as individuals. The book of Proverbs is rich with that. And uh, you can see how enriched our lives can be when it comes to friendship. So here we have all of these individuals, again, Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, Barnabas, Jesus, who's called Justice, uh, Luke, Nympha, uh, and then Archippus. And then he references uh, brethren in general. Paul promoted friendship. Here's a second thing that comes to my mind, and that is Paul promoted feelings that are to exist among friends in Christ. Um, as I was growing up, we were really encouraged to be thinkers and to be diligent and deep, serious students of Scripture. And that's a wonderful thing, Robert. But in the uh, summation of things, we probably leaned a little bit more toward the intellectual, a little bit more toward the logical, and how that in a logical, rational way, we should make certain that we form proper conclusions to establish our belief system. And that is a wonderful, wonderful emphasis that should never be minimized. <clears throat> but I fear that in a final analysis, we leaned in that direction and we kind of neglected the emotional. And that's just yeah. as important. I'm reminded, for example, of 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, behave ye like men, be strong. Now there's conviction. There's that deep, logical belief system. And we're to be people of conviction in that regard. <clears throat> but then also, he, the very next verse says, let all that you do be done in love. There's compassion. So you have the logical convictions in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And then with the same stroke of the quill, you have the emotional, you have compassion, you have love in verse um, 14. Mm -hmm. So they're together. And as we're reading Colossians, we see here the importance of having feelings reading through this three times in the reading paul used the word beloved tychicus a beloved brother he said onesimus our faithful and beloved brother he said and then Luke, the beloved physician, <clears throat> excuse me, in point of fact, Paul used the word beloved six times in the book of Colossians. He talks about Epaphras, 
our beloved fellow servant in Colossians 1, 7. He talks about Jesus, God's beloved son in Colossians 1, verse 13. He says to all the Christians, your chosen ones, holy and beloved in Colossians 3, verse 12. So he uses the word six times in the book of Colossians, but Robert, three of the six times are right here in the closing verses. And that really underscores the fact that Paul promoted feelings for one another as friends in Christ. We should never hesitate to say to one another, I love you. Remember the words of Jesus, love one another as I have loved you, John 13, 34 and 35. And remember that the Holy Spirit tells us through the Apostle Paul that we're to abound in love one toward another. In 1 Thessalonians, I think it's chapter 3, verse 14. And you can't read from the Apostle of John in the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John unless you're just bombarded by the word love. Therefore, John is called the Apostle of Love. The Bible teaches us to love each other and Here's another deep dive homework assignment. Mm -hmm. Go to 1 Corinthians 13 and camp for a while and see what love does. And then step back and ask, is that how I treat my fellow Christians, my friends in Christ? So there's this friendship that Paul promotes as he references all these people by name in the latter verses of Colossians. And then there's this these feelings of love that Paul promotes as he references the word beloved in describing some of these friends. Here's the third thing that I see, Robert. You can just chime in anytime you want to. I'll preach on. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pause. Share some thoughts with us here before no, we go I don't further. want to mess anything up. This is good. <laughs> okay. okay, well, the third thing that comes to my mind in these last verses, Paul promoted friendship and Paul promoted feelings of love, and then Paul promoted fellowship. And if we go back and read these verses a little slower, uh, it's it's easy to see that individuals' names just start jumping off the page because they're names that you don't hear very commonly outside of Mark and Luke. But as you read through these names and you see these little tidbits that Paul attaches to the names, there are some very interesting observations relative to fellowship. In point of fact, Paul actually uses the word fellow servant in verse 7 and fellow prisoner in verse 10 and fellow workers in verse 11. So he's writing from the, the premise of fellowship in Jesus. But watch how that beautiful fellowship that we share in Christ crosses differing barriers. For example, if you focused on the life of Onesimus, Christian fellowship crosses social barriers. Remember the book of Philemon, Robert? Mm -hmm. The whole book was written by Paul through the Holy Spirit, of course, to Philemon in reference to Onesimus, this, this fellow Onesimus here in verse uh, 9 of Colossians 4. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He ran away from Philemon. And Paul met him in prison, converted him to Jesus Christ, sends him back to Philemon, and the whole book of Philemon is where Paul is encouraging Philemon to accept Onesimus back, not as a runaway slave come home, but as a brother in Jesus, mm -hmm. a fellow servant in Christ. And so here was a slave, Onesimus, and a slave owner, Philemon. And they were from different social classes, and yet they were brought together by Jesus, 
Christianity crosses social barriers. Here's another thought. Christianity, Christian fellowship crosses racial barriers. Paul references Aristarchus and uh, Mark and Justice. And uh, he also referenced um, Tychicus. And he says this about them in verse 11. These are the only men of the circumcision, that would be Jews, among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. So he's writing to Gentiles and he references specific men by name and says, now they're Jews. Mm -hmm. And he's emphasizing the fellowship that the Gentiles of Colossae and the Jews that were accompanying Paul, who himself was a Jew, how they shared a fellowship in Christ despite their racial barriers. Take pause for just a moment. I am fed up, sick, and tired of watching the news today and how you have this group of people and how their lives matter, when in reality we know that all lives matter to God. There are no racial barriers in Christ Jesus. I'm reminded of what we find in the book of Galatians about that, and we're going to have, I want to read that verse in just a minute. But with just Jesus Christ and Christianity in the 21st century, there, there is no race. We're all of the chosen race, regardless of our background, regardless of the complexion of our skin. And that's one of the things that makes Christianity so beautiful. We can embrace each other in Christ. Our hearts beat as one in Christ despite our differing race or our different social status. Here's a third thought as we step back and put our finger on the pulse of all these names and tidbits that Paul references. Christian fellowship crosses social barriers and racial barriers and gender barriers. He references nympha in this passage. Now, all of these people are mentioned by name. She's the only one of all the individuals mentioned that is a female. And I know that not just because the name Nympha is feminine, but it says, greetings to Nympha and the church in her house. So here's a sister in Jesus. And she is opening up her home so that the church can assemble together for worship in her home. And greetings are especially extended to her by the Apostle Paul. Christianity crosses gender barriers. Sisters in Christ are just as important as brothers in Christ. And I know, Paul, uh, Robert, as you know, that Paul teaches us that we have differing roles mm -hmm. as men and women in the church. But even though we have differing roles, there's not one role more important than the other. And there's not one role that escalates one above the other. Right. We're all one in Christ, even though we have differing roles specifically designated by God through, through the uh, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So Christian fellowship crosses gender roles, and we as brothers need to see our sisters of equal importance, and our sisters need to see us as brothers as of equal importance, and our hearts beat as one again. Here's one final thought. Christian fellowship crosses social barriers and racial barriers and gender barriers, and it crosses geographical barriers. I wonder sometimes if we, as Christians in America, don't think that we're a little better than Christians that are in Africa or India or some other geographical setting. It's just not true. We are all of equal importance to our Heavenly Father and our older brother Jesus. Paul, in this passage, references the brothers at Laodicea in verse 15. And he, he says in verse 16, When this letter has been read among you, 
have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you read the letter from Laodicea. Now, I find it interesting that he references Laodicea four times in this reading, three times in the passages that I just read, and once more over in verse 13. Laodicea would be a rival to Colossae. Um, years I lived in a small West Tennessee town, and there was a sister town next to us, and boy, we were rivals. We were <laughs> uh, rivals when it came to economics. Uh, this city got something, and well, the next city needed it. One city got an airport. The next city needed to work sh on making sure that the rail system came there. We were <laughs> rivals in schools and in football, and it was amazing. Just like uh, in our state of Tennessee, you have Vanderbilt and the University of Tennessee and their rivals. Laodicea and Colossae were social and economic rivals, and there's a there's a a historical reason for that. Back in the fifteenth, uh, the fifth century B.C., Laodicea, excuse me, Colossae was the thriving place, and uh, that because of its geographic location. But by Paul's day, MacArthur says this, and I want to quote it, or I read it here. By Paul's day, the main road that went through Laodicea that made it such a tremendous uh, trade center, the main road had been rerouted from Colossae through nearby Laodicea, and Colossae was bypassed. And it says that that led, according to MacArthur, to the decline of the city of Colossae. But even though they were rivals economically and geographically as cities, the apostle, the Holy Spirit through the apostle Paul says, now you folks of Laodicea, you need to extend greetings to the folks of Colossae and the folks of Colossae need to extend greetings to the folks of Laodicea. And by the way, the letter that you're reading here, see that Laodiceans get to read it. And I wrote a letter to them and you need to read that one too. So Christian fellowship crosses social, racial, gender, and geographical barriers. It is the tie that binds and it's the tie by which our life is blessed, Christian fellowship. Paul promoted friendship, the feelings of love that we should enjoy as friends in Jesus, and the fellowship that we have one with another in Jesus. Pick it up there. I'm just thinking, you know, while that may have been news to Many of us who were listening, you know, the, the rivalry between Laodicea and Colossae, uh, the folks at, Laod at uh, Colossae would have definitely known <laughs> of that of that rivalry. They would have felt that, yeah. and um, perhaps even to some degree, maybe in the past, had participated in it in one form or another. And Paul's leadership and the proactivity, if that's a word, or the 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 degree to which he is proactive in encouraging that fellowship. By modeling it, he doesn't go into it. He just says, hey, greet those people. Right. Share this message with them. They need it too. And they've got a message. Of course, the letter to the church at Laodicea is not preserved for us in Scripture by God's providence, but we know that it existed. Paul says, hey, they've got a letter too, and you need to hear that. You yeah. need to read that. You know, I'm three times I read a word that it, it, we just glance right over it if we're not mm -hmm. careful. In this same reading, Paul, uh, Robert, Paul uses the word brother. He mm. uses the word brother three times. Man, that is a strong term of relationship, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Brother. I had three bro uh, two brothers. There are three of us guys. I had three sons. But the bond that brothers enjoy is something else. I can talk about them all I want, but don't you say the wrong thing about my brother. You know, we're going to fuss and we're going to fight, but don't you dare look at with cross eyed at my brothers. Mm -hmm. And this is the word that Paul uses three times in the closing words of the book of Colossians. This is indeed a 
powerful passage of Scripture, as you said, that we'll just kind of skip over if we're not careful. Yeah. But man, it tells us we really enjoy something if we are both members of the church of our Lord. Mm. We enjoy a friendship that is impregnated with feelings of love. It is a fellowship like none other. And I actually underlined when you were sharing with us thoughts from the imperatives, mm -hmm. I underlined that word outsiders in verse five. And I thought to myself, that's a sad word, mm -hmm. outsider. But the Holy Spirit needs, wants us to know if there are outsiders, there are insiders. Okay. There is this line that distinguishes those who enjoy this relationship from those who do not have this relationship. And I think that's an important thing to begin to close our episode with, Robert. And that is, um, you know, we live in a culture today that refuses almost to be judgmental. And, and I can appreciate that very much because I fear that all too often we're too judgmental, aren't yeah. we? Mm -hmm. But if we're not careful, uh, we'll perforate lines that God has drawn in Scripture. And God is very clear in saying there are the haves and have-nots. Mm -hmm. There are those that <clears throat> have a relationship with Him and can call God Father and can call Jesus brother and can call each other brethren. And there are there, then there are those that do not have that relationship. And I see that implied in this concept of walking in wisdom toward outsiders. There are folks that don't have what we have. And I, if I heard you rightly, what you encouraged us to do from a study of verse 5 is we need to make sure that we're walking in a way to where others see that spirit special bond we enjoy and want it yeah so this is this is truly a marvelous passage of scripture that underscores the joy of christian fellowship yeah. how does the book come to an end robert this is a great way to end our season yes. and this episode wow i was wow. gonna say don't let's not forget that last verse in i know there. we haven't come this far to skip over the last verse <laughs> <laughs> i know and what a verse it is yeah well and again this is one of those that we can skip over because paul does commonly use this or some phrase like it there at the end but it's just so filled with meaning it's worthy of a little bit of exploration Grace be with you at the end. Verse 18, since we didn't read it in its entirety. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Wow. I, I write this with my own hands. Mm -hmm. And there, I, I learned when I was going to school a big word. Hardly ever use it. Emanuensis. Emanuensis I'm sure you've heard yeah. that too. Yeah, that's a good I word. I say, what? <laughs> Five <laughs> syllables. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a secretary, so to speak. Yeah. Paul at times uh, used individuals to, uh, to write down the message that he was receiving from the Holy Spirit. But here he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. We don't know how much of this greeting toward the end that he wrote with his own hand, and it might say something as to Paul's age, and um, I can speak to that. I have arthritis bad in my right thumb, and I can barely write now. I can type like a demon, but I can't write worth a flip. <laughs> and it could be that Paul was kind of experiencing that. Yeah. Uh, but he says, as he's writing with his own hand, and if he's struggling to write with his own hand, look what he writes. Yeah. He says, grace be with you. Man, that really emphasizes that last sentence. I'm writing this with my own hand, and I just want you to know grace be with you. Now, how did Paul begin the letter? Do you remember that? Yeah. I do. I'm going back to one verse two, and uh, he mentioned grace there too. Grace to you. That's it. 
He, so he's, and by the way, he's writing again, chapter one, verse two, to saints and faithful brothers. Mm -hmm. So those that have this wonderful fellowship in Christ, he starts the epistle, grace to you. He ends the epistle, grace be with you. Here's another deep dive homework assignment. Take the time to look at every single epistle that Paul wrote mm -hmm. and see how many of them he started with the words, grace be to you or grace to you or words similar. And then go to the end of each one of those epistles and see how many of them he closed with the same words, grace be with you. It's absolutely amazing how the Apostle Paul could not pick up his quill and write to brothers unless he wanted to emphasize the fact it is God's mercy, God's love, God's kindness, the constituent elements that make for grace. It is God's grace that makes our relationship possible. Robert, it's the grace of God that binds my heart to yours. We differ in generation, but we love each other. And if people could hear us tit for tat with one another before, they would think, <laughs> those guys, I mean, it, it's, it's brutal. Yeah, and we have so much fun at each other's right. expense. We love each other. It's the grace of God that makes that possible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's the grace of God that makes our hearts beat as one with our fellow brothers and sisters that listen to us on a regular basis. And it's grace that we're wanting to extend to everybody mm. through every episode of this podcast that we lovingly call Today with Jesus. I'm going to throw it back to you. Mm. Hey, this why don't we is, tell everybody yes. what we're going to do next time? I, well, forgot I was about, about to that. say that very thing. This is the the season finale, which means we're closing out as you as you just noticed over the last fifty minutes or so. We've we've now concluded our study of Colossians, but that also means we're taking a little break. You won't see us for a while if you're listening to this sequentially. Now we know some of you in the future are going back and listening, and we're glad about that. That's wonderful. Yes. But if you're listening to this as we're releasing them in, in terms of time. We will take a little bit of a break, be back, Lord willing, in August of 2022 as we start recording again. And when we do so, we turn to a different text in the New Testament, and this time to the book of Acts with a very special focus, Brother Dan, that I'll let you introduce to the okay. people at home. We're going to go through the book of Acts, and uh, basically we're going to look at some of the teaching and the preaching that took place all through the book of Acts. And um, we haven't fleshed out all of the little details and nuances of the, uh, of the series or the season, but we'll be looking at perhaps this sermon. And we won't look at the sermon and then press on. We want to look at it and do a deep dive into the sermon itself and see what it says about Jesus. And then we'll go to another sermon and we'll spend two or three weeks with it and see what it says about Jesus. And we'll try to look at all of the sermons that we see throughout the book of Acts and what they say in specific about Jesus. And then we want to look also at the lives of people that we are introduced to in Acts and see what they had to say or how they felt about Jesus and see if through the process, we can't learn even more about our Lord. You know, as you read through the book of Acts, Robert, and uh, you read uh, some of these sermons, these individuals knew Jesus. They walked with Jesus, some of them. And those that didn't walk with Jesus were only one generation removed from Jesus. And they were uh, able to hear eyewitnesses talk about him. So it's great to go back to the book of Acts and uh, to see Jesus through their eyes. So we'll, we're going to entitle this, um, The Jesus They Knew. The Jesus They Knew. He's the Jesus I need to know. 
Mm. I don't want to hear what Jesus means to you as much as I want to know what Jesus should mean to me through the lives of those that knew him mm. and those that were close to him are close to those that knew him. And boy, I think that it's going to just really and en- en- enhance our Christianity and enrich our lives. I cannot wait. That's going to be so exciting. I can't wait to hear what you've got to say about it. <laughs> and I'm hoping in between now and then I'll have something worth hearing, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I do nothing more than read the passage and then let you take it and go from there, then we'll <laughs> oh, be in sure. good shape. <laughs> But it does sound like we'll be skipping around, right? We're not going Acts one through twenty eight. We're we're skipping around here and there. We may go sequentially, but we won't yeah. we won't do it. It's not a verse by verse or paragraph right. by paragraph study as was our uh, study of the book of Mark yeah. or our study of Colossians. Colossians but yeah. we'll, we'll it'll be more of a sequential look at this individual or this group of individuals and how Jesus uh, impacted this situation. Uh, you don't, you can't even get through chapter one, for example, unless you see, uh, folks in the upper room and they're praying to Jesus and they're asking Jesus for help and trying to make a decision. Wow. What a lesson there. Mm. And so, and then you come to chapter two and you see what Peter had to say about Jesus. And of course he walked with the Lord and, uh, to, it's just, I, I'm like you. I can't wait to dive into it's this study and, and be blessed. It's going to be good. Hey, in the meantime, you know, we got a little while before we have to wait. In the meantime, check out the website, thelightnetwork.tv slash TWJ. That's where all the episode archives live. If you haven't been through Q&A, what does Jesus say? Or if you haven't been through yeah. Mark, or if you missed parts of Colossians, go back and pick it up. It'd be a great summertime study for you as you get ready for the book of Acts, beginning, by the way, in August. Hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app or on YouTube so you never miss an episode. And... Help us talk this up with other people. Are there people with whom you worship or go to church with, as we say? Tell them about it. You got friends, coworkers you think would enjoy it, family members, hanging out over Memorial Day weekend or something like that. Tell them about Today with Jesus and help us spread the word about this podcast and its mission. And we could love I, to Could I say a note you. on that, Robert? Please. Just uh, very quickly. Those of us that are Christians, we know what Jesus can mean to our lives. And w- through today with Jesus, we try to really put an exclamation mark behind that and, and and strengthen the relationship we have with our Lord and with each other because of our Lord. Mm-hmm. There are so many in the world that don't enjoy what we have. And I would really like to encourage our regular listeners or Perhaps you have just been introduced to this podcast. I'd like to encourage all of us who uh, walk together on a regular basis to share the existence of this podcast with someone that might not worship regularly Mm -hmm. or someone that might look differently or be differently or even believe differently than you. Encourage them to turn to our podcast on a regular basis and do more than just that. Share thoughts about it. Once you have sat down with that individual, did you did you hear the recent podcast on Today with Jesus? Mm-hmm. What did you think about what Robert said in reference to, what Brother Dan said in reference to, and, and talk about the podcast and the discussions that we've had. And let's see if we can't encourage others through Today with Jesus to develop their own their own special walk with the Lord by following Scripture. That's really what we want to try to accomplish with Today with Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can help us with that, and we hope that you will. Thank you for watching, listening. Thank you for your participation in this study and for your feedback. And uh, until next time, we pray you'll be excited about August and join us then as we live today and every day with Jesus in our heart and our ways. God bless.